Hello and welcome back to the Timur Podcast, a show where you and I investigate Amir Timur, or Timur as we call him here. Last week we left off on a bit of a cliffhanger as Timur and his brother-in-law and friend, Amir Hussein, had just been crushed by the Mughals at the Battle of the Rain. In this episode we will look at what happens next immediately after the defeat, and unfortunately, as you have probably noticed, this will be a shorter episode than normal. Thankfully though, we do have more content coming out this week. Either today or tomorrow I will be releasing our second episode on our primary sources, and that episode is a bit longer and should make up for the fact that this one is a bit on the shorter end. But before we begin, I do have a quick announcement. And that announcement is that somebody lied to you. And that somebody was me. (laughs) So let me set the stage uh, for what happened, alright? I studied military history in college. I I actually have a degree in it. It is amazing what luck and a well-placed bribe can do. Uh, But during my last semester of college, I had the incredible opportunity to study abroad for five months in England. It was incredible. It changed my life. I got attacked by a gang outside of KFC, and a total stranger stopped me in a subway and told me I was possessed by demons. All in all, it was a great trip and a great experience. But during the study abroad program, I primarily studied the Crusades. And studying the Crusades in England and meeting some of the most prominent Crusade scholars was an amazing experience and I learned a ton. Now, why do I tell you this? Well, I know a little bit about the Crusades. In fact, besides Timurid history, possibly, the Crusades are the historical event, if you can call it an event, that I've studied the most. So, generally speaking, I feel pretty confident talking about the basics of the Crusades. I know the basics pretty well. I can explain kind of the the general gist of what happened. I know the key players. I know the general geography. Or so I thought. But I thought wrong. And that's why I bring this up. Last episode, while talking about how much power faith can have on soldiers and the battlefield, I told the story of when how during the First Crusade, the Crusaders found the supposed Holy Spear of Christ, which in turn inspired them to ride out and defeat a much stronger foe. I didn't make things complicated, these were just some very basic facts, and so I decided that I, I really didn't need to check the facts, I could just tell the story from memory, right? Wrong. That was a huge mistake. So it turns out that I got a few things wrong because of my confidence. And as the old saying goes, pride goeth before you ruin your podcast by lying to the listener. So forgive me for getting a few things wrong. I didn't mean it, obviously, but this was a good lesson for me. I need to double check my facts. Anyway, here's what I got wrong. First of all, I told you that the medieval city of Antioch is situated in what would today be the country of Syria. This is a lie. If you look at a map at the modern Middle East, you'll see that Turkey runs down the coast a bit, which includes where Antioch is located. Antioch is not in Syria, it is in Turkey. And I would not have caught this unless uh, a listener named Bortosh, and pardon me if I'm saying that wrong, but thank you so much Bortosh for very kindly pointing this out. Again, this could have been avoided on my end with about a 14 second Google search, but I was so confident about my knowledge. Okay, number two, I mentioned how Peter the Hermit was the guy who found the Holy Spear. Not correct. It was close. It was close. Uh, Peter the Hermit was a big player in the First Crusade, and the spear was found by a guy named Peter, But the man who claimed to have found the spear was a man named Peter Bartholomew, not Peter the Hermit. And this was, again, very kindly and graciously pointed out to me by a listener... A a listener called Senator Irrelevant Internet Person? I'm not insulting this person, I assure you, that is their username. But anyway, thank you both for catching these mistakes and letting me know. I really do appreciate it. And if anybody catches any mistakes in the future, or if something doesn't make sense, or if you simply want more clarification, always feel free to reach out to me to let you, to let, to let you know, to let me know, to let me... (sighs) <sighs> don't email me about that. Don't tell me that I messed up that sentence. I know I did. Okay, I am no doubt going to make mistakes in the future, just like I just did. So your help is very much appreciated. Now, with that cleared up, let's return to the story of Timur. <laughs> 
Last week, we saw how when Ilyas Khan, leader of the Mughals, when he returned to Transoxiana, Timur and Hussein were unable to defeat him. They certainly tried to, and maybe they even almost won, but in the end, the Mughals were victorious. And at the end of the Battle of the Rain, or the Battle of the Marsh, it saw Timur, Hussein, and the remnants of their army fleeing for their lives as men were being cut down and shot to pieces by the pursuing Mughals. Timur and Hussein both lived, and many of their men lived as well, but their army was in total disarray, scattered all across the region. One of our sources tells us that this retreat had been rather orderly, with minimal casualties, but every other source tells us that, that the troops had been scattered and only slowly trickled back to Timur and Hussein's camp. And this sounds to me more of a total rout, a stampede of men overcome with a basic instinct to survive rather than some sort of orderly retreat. We're told that Timur and Hussein eventually make their way back to the city of Kesh, Timur's own city. And here they, along with other tribal leaders, hold a quick war council to decide their next plan of action. Because although the two men are still alive, the situation looks terrible. Transoxiana is now more or less completely unprotected. The Mughals are free to ravage the country and the people with no army left to resist them. And indeed, almost immediately after the victory of the Battle of the Rains, Ilyas Khan began his march towards the city of Samarkand. Control of Samarkand effectively meant control of Transoxiana. There were no doubt people who wanted to stay and fight, fight for their homes and their pastures and their cities, but Timur and Hussein knew that such an act right now was completely hopeless. Thus, the two men split up again, Hussein returning to his Afghan lands, where he hoped to build up defenses and gather his allies for the inevitable Mughal invasion after Samarkand falls. He also sent spies back to the Mughals to keep an eye on their movement. While one of our sources claims that uh, Hussein intended to flee to India, if danger approached, the Zafranama gives Hussein the benefit of the doubt, saying that, and if fortune opposed him, he should nevertheless have the glory of dying in defense of his subjects. As for Timur, we're told he stayed in Kesh for a short time, gathering his family, his belongings, and as many of his people as he could before fleeing south as well. Timur fled across the Amu Darya to the city of Balkh, where he began putting defenses in order and rallying as many allies and troops he could find. And he too sent spies to watch the Mughals, and he also fortified the crossings of the river. And as the days went by, survivors from the battle continued to trickle back to Timur. And we're also told that entire nomadic tribes also fled Transoxiana in fear of the Mughals, and some of these people no doubt joined him. But despite these new additions of manpower, Timur also faced quite a few new challenges. We're told that many of his soldiers, and even one of his commanders, started to drink regularly, drinking to escape the world, and to escape what they viewed as inevitable destruction. Many men fled Timur's army, and some of these who fled even traveled back to Transoxiana to submit and to join the Mughals. Also, Timur sent several scouting parties back to Transoxiana, and a few of these groups were ambushed and annihilated. So although Timur and Hussein were still alive and still had some men, their situation was anything but hopeful. As for Transoxiana, it had been abandoned by the two princes. The land between the rivers was now open to suffer anything and everything at the hands of the Mughals. And the last step in subjugating Transoxiana was the capture of Samarkand. And the Mughals anticipated this an easy task. After all, they had just crushed the resistance army. Timur and Hussein had fled and were nowhere to be found. And while Samarkand did have walls, it had no citadel for the defenders to possibly fall back to. Further, the chronicles tell us that most of the men from the city had either died in the Battle of the Rain or were now fleeing. The prize was nearly theirs, the reconquest of Transoxiana nearly completed. Nevertheless, when Ilyas Khan and his Mughal warriors arrived at Samarkand, they found an unexpected sight. The gates were closed and barred, ditches had been dug, defensive preparations had been made, we're told that chains had been stretched across the streets in order to create barriers, but most importantly, the battlements were manned. 
Although, manned is probably not the right verb to use here. Defending the walls of Samarkand was a collection of a handful of leftover militia and soldiers who had stayed behind, but with them were young children carrying weapons and ready to fight, the youngest of whom were told were 12 years old. And then on the other spectrum of age, feeble old men who could barely walk were now on the battlements ready to fight. And besides all of them were the women, armed and ready to enact cruel revenge for their husbands and brothers and fathers and sons who would never return home. The people of Samarkand had risen. The Sarbadars were here. Now, who were the Sarbadars? And it's very possibly that I'm saying that name wrong. It might be the Sarbadars, but it's, it's hard to find many sources on them, never mind English audible sources, so I could very well be saying it wrong, but I'm going to stick with calling them Sarbadars. Anyway, to understand the Sarbadars, we have to pause the story and back up a few decades. As we saw many episodes back, in the year 1335, one of the four Mongolian Khanates, the Ilkhanate or Ilhanate, collapsed. This had been a Khanate that stretched from central Anatolia all the way into the heartland of Central Asia. But because of several inept leaders, constant wars with its neighbors, and ultimately the Black Death, the Ilkhanate was weakened to collapse. And in its place popped up, oh, 20 or so smaller kingdoms, and even of those, some of those can be broken down further, but the point being that this gigantic power vacuum emerged. And as you can imagine, some of these smaller states were soon gobbled up by more powerful neighbors, but what was often the case is that they were all so weak that they simply weren't able to conquer their other weak neighbors. This can be a little hard to visualize, so if you want, head on over to TimmerPodcast.com, look for the Maps tab at the top, and then scroll down to Maps number 5 and number 6, which shows the Middle East before and after the collapse of the Ilkhanate. We'll talk more about all of these different small kingdoms in the future. Timur will defeat most of them, one by one, but that is far in the future from where we are now. For now, if you're looking at map number six, if you look almost all the way to the easternmost kingdoms, you'll find a portion of the map named Sarbadars. This is roughly where the Sarbadars were located in what would today be eastern Iran and parts of Turkmenistan. As for who they were, the Sarbadars, like most of their neighbors, seized autonomy in the 1330s while the Ilkhanate was collapsing all around them. But this is where history takes a very strange turn. These other kingdoms, or sultanates, were typically ruled by one man of a dynastic line. He held sole power, it was his kingdom, he ruled over the people who were all his subjects, right? That's, that's pretty typical of medieval, medieval politics. But the Sarbadars were different. They were led, most of the time, by a collection of leaders, some of whom may have even been elected in a very, very crude form of republicanism. Now, what I've already said there in that one sentence is controversial, and really nobody agrees on just how the Sarbadars governed themselves, but they did exhibit a system of rule that was much more decentralized than their neighbors, and it was often led by a collection of men almost like an oligarchy. Now, these men, these leaders, were typically of two different factions. There were the more secular or religiously moderate guys who usually gained power through force of arms or politics. But the other type of leader who arose among the Sarbadars were religious dervishes, usually following Shia Islam. And they derived their power from stirring the people into religious fervor that promoted their position. Because of their, well, quite weird dynamic, which seems so out of place in 14th century Iran, the Sarbadars have received a ton of interest. For example, there are several Marxist historians who believe the Sarbadars are one of the first instance instances of an oppressed population rising against a monarchy structure. In contrast, there are a few historians who say that the Sarbadars were actually a perfect example of the upper classes taking over because they hated taxes. The Sarbadars have been called everything from robber state to proto-republic to religious oligarchy, among a whole bunch of other things. All things considered, though, it was probably a weird collection of all of these. Historian David Morgan sums it up pretty nicely when he says... Still, the Sarbadar leaders are perhaps hardly likely to have been proto-Lenins, though even so, the Sarbadar phenomenon was an extraordinary one, an interesting example of what might happen in Persia when central political control was released. And we'll talk more about the Sarbadars and the history of their short-lived state 
Uh, although state is a, probably too strong of a word, but the Sarbadars will exist from about 1337 until Timur takes over their land in the early 1380s. But as a quick interesting side note, the Sarbadars will be one of the few peoples who actually gets treated quite well by Timur. Sarbadar warriors became a mainstay in Timur's ranks, and he even rewarded the Sarbadars by not posting any of his own soldiers as a garrison in their capital. Still, with the coming of Timur though, the Sarbadars eventually faded into obscurity. But we have one more thing we need to talk about the Sarbadars before we jump back into the Siege of Samarkand. The Sarbadars were a divided group. There were all sorts of rivalries and religious differences between them, but they all did have one thing in common. They hated being ruled by Mongols. In fact, they hated being ruled by Mongols so much that this is ultimately the thing that brought them together. In fact, the name Sarbadar either means gallows bird or heads on the gallows. And the meaning behind this ominous name is that the Sarbadars would rather go to the gallows and be eaten by birds than submit to Mongolian rule. And I'm just gonna say it, that is pretty badass. And through their short autonomy, the Sarbadars will have all sorts of fights among themselves, with most of their leaders meeting violent ends at the hands of other rivals, but never will anybody from the former Mongolian Ilkhanate or Mongolian Empire take control of the Sarbadars. They would rather die than have this happen. So returning to the siege of Samarkand, the chronicles tell us that a group of religious Sarbadars had gathered the citizens together and implored them to think of their families and of their freedom and for their hate for Mughal or Mongolian oppression. And the people reacted with fervor. The Zafarnama reads, the people who imagined the tyrannical government of the Mughals would cause an entire desolation of the city undertook to defend it, uh, defend it, hmm, almost had it there, <laughs> undertook to defend it against the barbarians. There we go. And there is some speculation as to whether or not these Sarbadars here actually were Sarbadars, and we don't really know, but what we do know is that they hated the Mughals, used religious inspiration, and inspired the people to rise up. And that sounds pretty similar to the Sarbadars, and it's no surprise that our sources just assumed that it was them. But returning to the siege, Ilyas Khan ordered attacks to be launched, and we're told that the most violent encounters took place in the barricaded suburbs. The Mughals charged into the defenders and were driven back. They charged again and were driven back again, and then again driven back, charged again, driven back. And several days went by like this with both sides taking heavy losses and the attackers unable to finish off a city that they thought should have been an easy victory. And then, as the siege continues, disaster strikes among the moguls. A terrible plague starts to infect the mogul horses, and the horses collapse one by one. And the men can do nothing as they watch their horses, their livelihood, their mobility, their other half in combat die. And we're told three out of every four mogul horses is killed by this plague. This horrific plague and the loss of their horses, along with this surprising and effective citizen defense, convinces Ilyas Khan that the siege is lost. Transoxiana is lost, he must retreat home. And so the Mughals retreated, walking on foot back to their homes in Magulistan. The third Mughal invasion of Transoxiana was defeated. Thank you for listening to the Timmer Podcast. If you enjoy the show, a rating or review on whatever listening platform you're using is greatly appreciated. And thank you for everyone who has done that. I really appreciate it. As always, feel free to reach out to me by email at timmerpodcast at gmail.com or follow the show on Facebook at TimmerPod or on Twitter at podcast pod. You know what? I'm not going to tell you. You got to find it. No, just kidding. It's Podcast Timmer on Twitter. Anyway, I should get our, our second primary source episode out in the next day or so, I'm hoping. I have it all written and ready to go. I just need to record it and edit it. In our next real episode, well, not real episode, in our next normal episode on Timur's story, though, we'll examine what he and Hussein do when they hear the news of the victory at Samarkand. Find out what happens next week right here on the Timur Podcast. Timur Podcast.